Welcome everybody to Go Local Live. I'm Josh Fenton, CEO and co-founder. First thing, first thing, uh, Rebecca Cotto da Silva for joining us from Balzano, Italy. Uh, Italy had a major upswing in the number of cases, up over 800 cases, the highest number since the lockdown was released uh, more than two months ago. And it is concerning Italians as to what the implications of, are they going into a second surge situation? Schools are supposed to open up as she told us uh, in the first week in September. So much concern over in Italy as to what the status is of the coronavirus. Uh, at, at 12 noon, we'll have Dr. Michael Fine. Stay tuned, also we'll have a video from Mayor Alorza's press conference. Providence has had five murders in the past two weeks. This is his first public comment on these murders. Uh, nine murders in the past two months, on pace to be a, a record. In the first six months of the year, only one murder. So uh, a big, big change. And obviously, policing is a major, much major public policy discussion here in Providence and across the country. Let's go to the professor, Jennifer Lawless, chair of the political science department at the University of Virginia. Uh, professor, thank you for joining us. I'm happy to be with you. It was a Democratic palooza this week. Uh, they could not be in Milwaukee. They seemed heartbroken that they could only be in Delaware. Uh, let, let's go with the broad strokes uh, first. What, what's your overall impression of the week? I think it's hard to imagine a better week for the Democrats. They pulled off an unconventional convention in a way that was creative and that had only a few glitches technologically. They had amazing speakers each night. And so if you didn't tune in for Michelle Obama, that was okay because you could see Barack Obama. If you missed Barack Obama, that was okay. You could see Kamala Harris. It, it was just they had very, very substantial headliners each night. And I also think they demonstrated the diversity among the Democratic Party in a way that's difficult to do when you don't have the ability or the requirement, really, to rely only on virtual technology. The convention hall would have looked diverse, but I think here they were really, really able to highlight what the party looks like and how it reflects America. So I would say that with a few technological glitches and Julia Louis-Dreyfus, who wasn't particularly compelling last night, it was a home run. Yeah, I didn't, those Hollywood uh, guest hosts during the course of the week, I'm not sure were a big plus, but uh, you know, that's that Democratic Party Hollywood contingent. Um, I've I, I got one question, though. Listen, they did a spectacular job of highlighting uh, minority representation. Did they do a good job reaching out to middle America, white, male and female voters who have been the swing voters in each of the last presidential elections? Did they talk to that person who lives in a suburb outside of Cleveland, Ohio? I think they did, and I think they did in a couple of ways. First of all, part of the reason that they relied so heavily on these various speakers from around the country was because regardless of what they looked like, they were enduring the same kinds of circumstances and trying to overcome the same kinds of problems that most Americans are facing. They're struggling with jobs, they're struggling with healthcare, they're struggling with trying to figure out how to navigate COVID-19 and living amid a pandemic. And so although the, um, the photo spread really did highlight diversity, I think it's very likely that any Democratic voter tuning in saw something that they could relate to. The other reason that I think they highlight, that they did a very good job on that front is based on the speakers that they had. I mean, they profiled and they gave speaking time to former candidates and elected officials who are particularly compelling among that suburban demographic. So, you know, I think it's very difficult to argue that any part of the Democratic Party, any independent who's genuinely a swing voter, wouldn't have found something that they were able to relate to over the course of those four days. I haven't seen the ratings yet, but two things seem to be missing. And listen, it, it's a virtual world, right? There's lots of things that are changing and haven't been completely figured out. One was that energy in a convention hall, right? And also the reaction of the convention hall to those great one-liners. You know, Ann Richards, George Bush was born with a silver foot in his mouth, right? Those are memorable, bring the house down lines that somewhat changes uh, uh, political futures. Um, the second was there was no intrigue, right? There was no, there was no debate on the floor of why is AOC only getting a minute and a half? 
There was none of that sort of game within the game that sometimes becomes the most exciting part of the whole convention. Right, so on the second point, I think it's important to remember that most of that would only have been evident to real political junkies anyway, because the intricacies of how the process works or voting on a platform or debating speaking time would not have happened during primetime hours. So it's true that people like you and I missed out on that, but the typical voter who is unlikely to watch this in the first place but may have tuned in probably didn't realize they missed that. I do agree that not having the convention hall atmosphere makes it less uh, less fun, less, less, less memorable. But I would say that this is a really somber time, and in a way, it really called for sobering speeches. And so in some ways, the current environment may have mitigated some of the lack of enthusiasm. I do believe, though, that if we move forward in a way where a large component of this will be virtual, they've got to figure out that awkwardness at the end, like where everybody's just standing on the stage staring at a computer screen. It didn't work. You can still have a balloon drop if no one's there. <laughs> um, David Sirota, former speech writer and insider on the Bernie Sanders campaign, writes a uh, daily newsletter called TMI, Too Much Information. He really took it to the Biden folks this week on the lack of specifics, the lack of policy, the lack of discussion about how you're going to improve America. Uh, is that a fair criticism? I think it's a fair criticism if we don't start seeing those kinds of discussions between now and the election. As far as the convention is concerned, this election right now and the way the convention set it up really is a referendum on Donald Trump. And that's what we saw last night, and it's what we saw Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday as well. If you think the president is not doing a good job, whether it be on the pandemic or on the economy or on any other issue, you have to vote for change. And it's incumbent upon the Democrats to demonstrate what that change looks like, and they did, but certainly policy was not a major focus. But I, I think, again, that's a result of where we are right now and the issues that matter most to the American people. Uh, let's go to Joe Biden's performance last night. Uh, what's your take? How well did he do? What did he miss on? And uh, did that give him the bounce that he needed coming out of uh, Delaware? Well, first I would note, I'm not sure he needs a bounce. What he needs is for these polls to remain as stable as they've been. If the polls can stay, he's good to go. Uh, if he gets a bounce, that's great, and but that's icing on the cake. I think he probably refuted the biggest argument of the Trump campaign, which is that he is not competent or Lacks, he lacks the mental acuity to be president. That speech, whether you thought it was compelling, whether you thought it was delivered perfectly or not, demonstrated that he can stand there and deliver powerful remarks for 25 minutes and be completely lucid. So anybody that had concerns, I think those concerns were quelled. The other thing about his performance that I found really compelling is that he's one of these politicians who really is able to pivot between being empathetic and talking about a personal moment to the direction that the country needs to go. And he is able to pivot between being really emotional and being angry and demanding in a way that a lot of politicians are not. So he's not the orator that Barack Obama is. He doesn't deliver the kinds of speeches that Bill Clinton did, but I think he did an excellent job. And for him, it was probably the best speech he's given. Yeah, that, that I don't know. Listen, I, <clears throat> we've all seen a lot of speeches. I thought it was a fine speech, nothing uh, Outrageous. I was disappointed to hear that that's the best he's got. Um, uh, you know, I'd seen him on the floor of the Senate, and he was a good speaker on the, in the, on the Senate floor, as, you know, pretty average or maybe a little above average. But I, I was surprised that his closest friends say that was his greatest speech ever. That was a little disappointing. Um, does, does, do the Democrats, did they achieve everything? What, if anything, did they not achieve? I think they did. I mean, the only thing, again, that I think they decided not to focus that explicitly on were policy details, but I think it was strategic. If their whole plan is to make this about char mostly about character and integrity and the ability to lead the nation through a crisis, not as a partisan president, but as an American president, which is something that Biden highlighted in his speech last night, then it behooves them to highlight the policy differences they have with the Republicans, but really try to make this about taking down Donald Trump and not taking down the Republican Party. They need some of those Republicans, if not to cross party lines, then to work with them if Biden is elected president. 
in the electorate, they need some of those Republicans, if not to cross party lines, then not to vote. So strategically, being a little bit light on some policy nuances probably pays dividends in terms of election outcomes. Okay. So is the uh, district attorney from the Southern District of New York going to be the next attorney general in the Biden, uh, in the Biden administration? Because uh, I believe she dropped a, a major bombshell. Uh, she uh, announced and arrested and charged uh, Steve Bannon, uh, former top strategist to Donald Trump, <laughs> on Joe Biden's speech day. I mean, yeah, how, well, <laughs> how well timed was that? Was that yeah. a split screen that the Democrats were running? <laughs> I, or, or did Fox News not even show the convention? I don't know. Um, I, I mean, I think that uh, if, if Biden genuinely doesn't hold grudges, then yeah, definite appointment. Um, you know, it was, it, it did upstage the convention a little bit, but it actually turned out to be perfect for the Biden campaign and for the Democrats in general, because it again, just highlights and allows them to make a juxtaposition when it comes to decency and judgment in this White House versus what decency and judgment would look like in a Biden White House. So, uh, you know, we've talked about it uh, virtually every week. You know, Donald Trump has, has been inconsistent in messaging, um, often flailing and, and diverting himself. Um, you've made the comment in the past wh when he does stay on message and there is a strategy he's still very, very dangerous. Uh, I think one of the issues that is, uh, Democrats have tremendous vulnerability on is this defund the police narrative. And we're seeing it in Providence. One murder through, through almost the end of June, call it a, a coincidence, n not so likely. Um, defund the police movement in Providence, and we're seeing a huge upswing in violent crimes. And you're seeing places like Portland, Oregon, get the federal troop, federal officers out. They get the federal officers out. It's no better in Portland, Oregon. And while Joe Biden has clearly said, I don't support defund the police, there's certainly folks that are on the Democratic Party who are strong, angry advocates who think that the culture of policing is broken and police departments need to be literally defunded. How do the Democrats navigate that and, and is that their Achilles heel potentially coming up in November? Well, one thing that they have going for them is that the uptick in violent crime and all of these discussions are happening under a Trump presidency. So when we think, for example, historically back to, excuse me, uh, 1988, when George W. Bush was running, uh, George H. W. Bush was running against Michael Dukakis, the soft on crime issue was in part because they were running in an open seat. They were running, you know, I, both of them to be president. And Dukakis was soft on crime in Massachusetts, or so the Bush campaign alleged. Here, it's very difficult for Trump to make this argument stick when it's happening on his watch. If he's so strong on law and order, then why does the nation look this way? If he doesn't think states have power and he can do everything and solve every problem, then why are we seeing this uptick? If he can send in federal troops and change the way that policing works, then why is he also saying that there's carnage on the streets of Chicago? So I think that the Democrats have a little bit of flexibility here in how they respond and how they fine tune their message, because this is happening under Trump's watch. And his stories about why it's happening are inconsistent with his broader narrative about the power of the presidency. Um, let's go shift gears completely. We'll wrap up with a little presidential politics, but let's go to these colleges and universities. Uh, the initial openings, uh, your, one of your rivals, you're at the University of Virginia, your ACC rival, UNC, uh, was featured on 60 Minutes about four weeks ago. Their administration felt very confident that they had worked out a strategy, that they were ready to go and they'd be able to open in classes. That lasted, oh, about 15 minutes. Notre Dame, the same, University of uh, Michigan State University and on and on. Uh, what's, what's the problem here? This is, uh, 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 is it just y youthful energy that is uncontrollable and, uh, and this is gonna take down uh, many American colleges and universities? Part of it is that, but part of it is also the fact that these colleges and universities, many of them, are trying to reopen in places where the positivity rate and the incidence rate are still well above 
So the same way that we saw reopenings in cities and towns across the country that led to problems because all of the CDC guidelines had not yet been met, we're seeing that again on college campuses. And you can ask any professor out there, I've yet to hear from or meet one who didn't anticipate that this would happen. You know, you can do everything that you can to make sure that the classrooms are set up in a socially distanced, safe way. You can do everything you can to make sure that the campus is capable of responding to an uptick in COVID cases. But at the end of the day, college students have freedom. And when they leave the classroom or they leave the campus, they can do whatever they want. And there's no reason to expect that they're not going to behave the same way that a lot of adults around the country have been behaving. And we're seeing that bear out now. Does that play into one political parties or the others? I mean, certainly there's a narrative going on that all the failures in the coronavirus are a federal failure and thus a Trump failure. But does this also just speak to, th this is just a nasty virus that is highly contagious. And listen, it, it doesn't matter what you do in certain situations, it's gonna move around and infect people and some people are gonna get sick and some people are gonna die. Well, I don't know if that's true because at both Notre Dame and UNC, the large uptick in cases was related to and traced back to off-campus parties that were very, very crowded and that involved people not wearing masks. So it's not just a situation where like, oh, poof, the virus is there and people get sick, right? We know why a lot of these kids got sick. And I think that works to the Democrats' advantage in that we need a national or federal plan and mandate to get this thing under control. Um, you know, the fact that this is happening on college campuses, I think also plays to the Democrats' advantage because for a very long time, the Trump administration was saying young people, and they weren't only talking about little kids, but young people in general were not very susceptible. And this is one more way that the science doesn't seem to comport with what the administration's talking points are. Okay, let's go back to D.C. Um, how good a week was this for Joe Biden? And, and, you know, there is one little skunk in, in, in the yard. Uh, CNN had a poll released on Monday, which had the, the Biden poll narrowing to 50-46 over Trump. That is an outlier poll. Most polls have Biden up 9 to 11 points. Uh, but is that, listen, uh, we all question how good polling is these days, especially after 16. But is that a, a, is that a underlying little worrisome for the Biden group and as they move forward? I don't think so. First, it's typical as we head into the conventions and as we head into the fall for people to return home. And by that, I mean Republicans who might have been tepid on Donald Trump are still probably going to now be more likely to vote to voice their support for him. Independents who typically lean Republican are probably going to be more vocal about leaning Republican. So we would expect the polls to narrow. But the reason I'm not particularly concerned about the national polls is that we've learned in the past, and we know based on the structure of the Constitution, that this is fought at the state level. And if you look at the battleground states, those polls have been remarkably stable, more stable than they've been in, very, in several recent presidential elections. So if the numbers in Pennsylvania and Michigan and Wisconsin maintain and stay where they are, it's hard to imagine that Joe Biden doesn't win this race. Again, things can change. We still have some time, but I'm much more optimistic. If I'm, if, as a Democrat, I'm more optimistic looking at those state polls than I am looking at any variation in the national polls. Is there any path for Trump to pick up a Nevada, a Minnesota, on any of those states that are kind of historically won two points? They're, they lean Democrat, but they, you know, they're within that margin of error that they could go Republican. Yeah, I saw yesterday that he's now, you know, spending money and doing ad buys in those two states. Uh, he's on defense. And I think to try and expand the map makes the Democrats happy. If, if Donald Trump is actually deploying resources to states like Nevada and Minnesota, um, th that's money not being spent in Ohio and Florida and Michigan, Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. So, you know, generally speaking, I think Trump's best strategy would be to recreate the 2016 map. And he can lose a couple. He can't lose all of the states that he won, but he can lose a couple of them. I don't think expanding the map makes much sense in this political climate. 74 days to go. If we look back 74 days, the world was completely different. Uh, if we move forward 74 days, uh, what is the danger points for Joe Biden? What are those factors that could come out of nowhere? Are they a foreign relations issue? 
Are they d domestic disturbance issue? What exactly are the danger zones for Joe Biden? I think it's really going to be around election rules, regulations, the post office, what voting looks like. Um, it seems like both sides have now pretty much resigned themselves to the fact that these are the dynamics of the campaign. And these are the two campaigns. These are the two choices. The question now becomes, are people going to be able to exercise their vote in a way that is, A, safe, and B, ensures that it's counted? And there, we're beginning to see some real differences on both sides of the aisle about what's appropriate. So although there could always be an international relations crisis, although there could always be some domestic disturbance that we can't anticipate, I do think that um, voting rules, reforms, and regulations are where, if there's going to be any blip, we'll see it. Jennifer Lawless, thank you so much. I greatly appreciate your insights after this Democratic convention. Look forward to hearing from you next week about the Republican convention. Uh, for everyone else, uh, please stay tuned. 12 noon, Dr. Michael Fine. Lots of questions about numbers in Rhode Island and testing, real questions about how well Rhode Island is doing testing now. Uh, we'll be back at 12 noon. Please stay safe and wear your mask.